It's our 25th anniversary here in FCF. So all of you from FCF and those of you who are visitors of people from FCF, happy anniversary to you. Yeah. Happy anniversary. When you talk about anniversaries, it's exciting. It's always like it carries something there, a notion of achievement and celebration, milestone in life. It's like a, almost like a personal new year, right? You start something new. And for those of us who are of the more conscientious kind, we start asking questions. Like, how did I do last year? Did I even make an impact? Did I even matter? Um, and with that question, since our anniversaries, are called Friend Day. We, we decided to concentrate more of, not too much on like um, celebrating the church itself, although we do, but make it more significant by inviting our friends because the one that really matters, who really matters are our friends. And in the light of that, it behooves me to somehow address an issue that um, has touched a lot of my friends, or a lot of people I know who have friends who are very dear to them. That's a feeling of insignificance, feeling of unworthiness and security on acceptance and feeling that I don't matter. I don't matter here in life because of the deep emotional scars, even mental anguish that people experience because of these things, because of their perceived lack of importance or value. What happens is probably some of you are, if not all of us are, trying to like work so hard trying to accomplish a lot of things, trying to keep on reaching higher and constantly upping the ante and trying our very best, like in a very tiring schedule, like we're spinning like a crazy top, just so that we'll reach that level which society calls or somehow deems as the highest of statuses in our society. But what I want to start out right away after having said that, it's not to, not to start with a somber note like that, but to let you know, whoever you are, whatever your degree is, whatever your career is, whatever your work is, that you're okay, just as you are. Amen. Well, in fact, let's say this, you are more than okay. Is that good? Yes. And why don't you tell the person you came with or is next to you, you are more than okay. <laughs> you are more than okay. In fact, tell them, you're not okay, you're more than okay. You're actually great. All right? Is that a good encouragement to start with? Yes. In fact, let me tell you honestly, this is not me saying this to encourage you or flatter anyone here. It's not our job, not my job, not my call to do it. But it's something that I want to assure you of. It's a biblical thing that proceeds right from the very word of God. You're important. Yes. You're valuable. You're so great. You're so great and your greatness is so obvious that you neither have to prove yourself to anyone or be proud about it. You can be humble about it. Because you know you're secure about your status. And I'm going to talk to you about this. And I was like invited to speak at, a, at an anniversary of a church. And they gave me a topic that talks about humility and pride. And I said like, an anniversary. And I'm going to talk about humility and pride. Dear God, I need your help. <laughs> because humility and pride are not topics that people would want to talk about. You write books about humility, they're not going to buy it. It's not going to be a bestseller. Okay, but after I shared it, I saw a lot of truths in my reading that I said, it, these are treasures that I want our people to also uh, experience and have a, have a taste of. So I'm going to go ahead and read the scripture found in John chapter 3, verses 22 through 30. And this is what it says from the New Living Translation. Then Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem and went into the Judean countryside. Jesus spent some time with them there, baptizing people. At this time, John the Baptist was baptizing at Anon, near Salem, because there was plenty of water there, and people kept coming to him for a baptism. This was before John was thrown into prison. A debate broke out between John's disciples and a certain Jew over ceremonial cleansing. So John's disciples came to him and said, Rabbi, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one you identified as the Messiah, is also baptizing people, and everybody is going to him instead of coming to us. John replied, No one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I told you I am not the Messiah, 
I'm only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride, and the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. Okay, let's read that last verse all together. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. If you look at this passage, it is replete or inundated with salient and very consequential truths that we really don't have enough time in the world like to the gem. They ought to mine all the gems from this verse because of the limited time we have. But I'm going to point to you some stuff that we would learn so much from. So we have to, we can live this life enjoying it, not having to worry about, am I really that important? Do I really matter? Because a lot of people, as I say to you, and I, I've, I've just been introduced to, to people, even like a single 13-year-old, like very young kids, losing interest in life. Not seeing it as something valuable, and because it doesn't matter any longer, I, I don't want it. And it breaks your heart, especially the closer it gets to home. You go like, if it's a news about other people, it's okay. And it's not okay, but at the same time, we're not so affected with it. But when it comes close to home, suddenly there's, there's a nerve-wracking reality. So but I'm going to share to you how John the Baptist, in the middle of the provocation and temptation, and it's almost like an influence of his disciples, to create some kind of like, like competition between him and Jesus, stood his ground and did not get affected by the influence or the temptation to have this competition with a man he introduced before as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So what made him still stay humble and keep humble, despite the fact that there were a lot of things around him going, look at that person, he's performing much better than you are, you're losing your significance and your value. You're going to be nothing very soon. What made him keep his ground and stand his ground without being affected by it? Saying, like, it's okay. It doesn't matter. In fact, I'm happy about it. Right? Okay, you want to have that attitude? We're going to take a look at some stuff. I don't know how much I could, um, okay. I got so much things I need to say, but I'll stop whenever I have to. If I can only give you one truth, take it with you, and I know it's going to make a big difference in your life. So the first thing that you notice at least here in this verse is found in John 3, 27 and 28 is this. If you want to have this kind of life where you're satisfied and you are okay with whatever is going on, whatever people say about you, is that you recognize that every good thing we have is from God. Okay? There are two identities here, entities that are involved. God and you. Recognize that every good thing we have and that's a good thing because we have good things. Can you attest to that? Can you affirm that? Yes. We have good things in life. And then you have to recognize that every good thing you have is from God. It's so in verse 27, it says, John replied, No one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I told you I am not the Messiah. I am only here to prepare the way for Him. So if you exegete this or at least interpret that just like out of the context, you're going to say that he was talking about what did God give me? What did heaven give me? The people who are coming to me for baptism, perhaps that. Or me and my calling, I'm only here to prepare the way for him, perhaps that. But with all our callings and the people that come to our lives, we have received a lot more blessings from God. We could go around this room except that time would not allow us. But there are a lot of blessings we have. I could enumerate things. When I preached this one time, I think I occupied about 15 minutes just enumerating. Enumerating all the things and probably just a very few other things that God has given to us. But the implication here is that God gives us things and gifts. And we've got to be careful to acknowledge that He's the one that gives us everything. And now, but let me hasten to say this because there are a lot of people who philosophize this, especially those who don't really like God, and say, uh-huh, caught you there. What do you mean by that? If God gives us everything, then that means to say even those bad things, sufferings, and evil things that come to me are from God. And sometimes they could identify with people and feel their heartache for some reasons or where they may be coming from, something that causes them that pain that makes them hate God. 
I don't know if you know some people in your life who do hate mom. But when some bad things happen to them, it doesn't matter if they say, God, I don't want you. I don't want you to have anything to do with me. But when tragedy strikes, what's the first thing they do? Why did you do that? Why did you not stop it? Why did you do those things that cost me to suffer like this? Right? So we understand the pain. But there are just people who really are... I'm sorry to say this, there are just people who don't even want to reason, they're just close-minded about it. I don't like God, I don't believe in Him, and they spend their entire life hating on Him. He does not exist, but they, they just spend their whole, whole life hating on the God they don't believe exists. Okay, so they thumb their noses on Him, they raise their wrists, or they, they clinch their fists against God, and then blame Him for everything. But this is something that I'd like to like, clarify, because when John says everything... Everything is given from heaven. That's an implication that there are good things. Because when you think about heaven, you think about good. You think about perfection. You think about divine benevolence or goodness. So that's what John was saying. But in fact, one of my favorite verses in the Bible corroborates this. Okay, John 1.17 tells us all good. Everybody say good and perfect. That's it. All good and perfect gift comes from above. Okay. All good and perfect gift comes from above. And it says, And cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. This is a beautiful qualifier here. Coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness. He doesn't change. He doesn't go, I'm going to give you some good things today, but tomorrow I decide to give you some evil things. He doesn't, he's not like shifting shadow. And he says, he, there you go, neither shadow of turning. And he does not regret when he gives you good things and blesses us. He does not change his mind and say, why did I bless Adrian? I made a mistake. Okay? Why did, I, why did I give him breath today? I changed my mind. Oh, poor Adrian, right? Okay? But that's a qualifier. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. And this is something that our Lord Jesus explicitly stated when he was here on earth. You know how we blame God for everything that is bad? Jesus said, watch. Because the reason why you are blaming God and blaming me for things that are not right is because you probably don't know the truth regarding these things. Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief, referring to Satan, the thief comes not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Because, but I came to give life and give it more abundantly. So what he's saying is, when you experience some loss, death of a loved one and destruction in your life. That's not God. That's not God. That's the devil. What is a God? He said, I came to give you life that is abundant, full of meaning, full of purpose, life that is so satisfying, extremely satisfying. That's what I give to you. And that's the most beautiful thing. But of course, we've got to be very careful when it comes to like saying that all of these good things that have come to my life is because of my own doing. God warned the Israelites in the Old Testament. You're going to receive a lot of blessings when you come to the promised land. But don't ever say it's your own hands that cost you to have all of those things. Deuteronomy 18, 18. Because it is God who gives you the ability to get wealth. You are you here with me? Yes. Okay. So here's the deal. It's like when I'm seeing this, when God is putting this before us, that everything comes from Him. It's not so much in Him wanting to glory about Himself and say, I want you to see as somebody so big, so strong, and so benevolent that, you know, I'm this great, you know. It has something to do with you. And what is that? He's saying, yes, it is a very humbling truth to, re to realize and recognize that God gives you everything good. But it's also a very restful truth. When you know that God will give you what you need. Amen. Are you here with me? Yes. And sometimes I wonder why when you talk about rest. Jesus Christ said, come unto me. Matthew 11, 20. You've heard that before. Come unto me. Those of you who are weary. How many of you here family are weary? Okay. And are heavily laden. Heavily loaded. And I will give you what? Rest. rest. How many of you here want rest? How many of you here need rest? Okay? And then in, in, in John chapter 14, verse 27, he says, Peace I live with you, leave with you. Peace I give unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Not as the world gives. He goes, that's what I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. So every time you hear that word, rest, 
He wants to give you rest. He invites us to have rest. He invites us to have peace. But every time, especially when you hear that word rest and peace in combination, you know what we think about a lot of times? Right? <laughs> laughing because you know where I'm going to, right? Every time the combination, this amalgam of rest and peace come together, we think about people who are departed. R.I.P. You know what that stands for, right? Rest in peace. Why do you have to wait until your loved ones pass away before they experience rest? Do you really have to wait until they're dead before they experience rest? Jesus said you don't have to wait for that. Some people are like, ah, I don't think so, Pastor. I think, really? You don't believe me that most of the time the accepted usage of the word rest in peace is mostly not for the living but for the dead. Every time, next time you see each other, instead of saying, hi, bye, hello, somebody says to you, hi, Pastor, you go, rest in peace. <laughs> if I tell you right now, turn to the person, don't do this. But if I tell you right now, turn to the person next to you and tell them, rest in peace. They're probably not going to like it. Right? But why do we feel awkward about it when Jesus said, I want you to have rest. And I want you to have peace. Family, I believe some of you today have been brought here by God just for you to know that you got to stop. It's enough that you've been spinning like a time. Working so hard. Thinking that I need to make provisions for this and this and this. That sometimes we're losing time, like what Sheila saying a while ago. It's so beautiful. It's so like straight to the point. If my heart loves something else more than you, it's like the heart trick. But the message of that is you don't have to love anybody more than Jesus. Because he is more than sufficient. For all of us. Amen. Are you here? He's saying, I'm the one who will give you. Stop struggling. Stop striving. I'm not saying be lazy. I always have this thing that I call restful diligence. you got to be diligent. Work hard. But be restful. Once you're stretching yourself so thinly. And you don't have time to sleep. You have two jobs, three jobs, four jobs. Because I want my kids to live. And they're like overweight. <laughs> they live. <laughs> right? Okay, but you, we, 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 want to, we want to secure their future. Do you realize that it doesn't matter how much money you make, you always feel like it's not enough. We don't have time for devotions, we don't have time with the Lord because, because we think we are, we are the ones responsible. Remember what God said, it's not your hands. I will take care of you. Amen. And that's a promise to make. Look at what he said. Do you know how easy it is to live a wonderful life where everything is provided for? Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33. You know this. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything you need up will be provided for you. Is that Jesus saying that? Yes, it is. Yes. You think he lies? No, he does it. You think you can believe him? Yes, I can. When Jesus says to you, seek me first and how to live righteously, and I'll take care of all your needs, he would not lie. That's why Philippians 4.19 says, I will supply, but my God shall supply all your needs. Not according to your company's wealth, not according to Bill Gates' wealth, not according to like Jim Bezos' wealth. Is it Jim? I forgot yeah. right. Anybody, yeah. not, 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 yeah. not according to anybody's wealth, but according to the riches of God in heaven. Amen. Inexhaustible riches. Amen. That's the reason why you're going to have confidence. God, whatever I need, whatever I need, you're going to supply it. If I need $10 million, God will not have any problem giving it to me. So I'm going to go, do you have $10 million, Pastor? I don't need it. Are you here? He said, he just wants your family. Today and our anniversary. When you think so much about, did I achieve this, achieve that, did I accomplish this? Rest. Some of you have 30-year-old kids that should be like working for you now. But you're still buying them a lot of stuff. Like, ooh, that's right, you have, should have not come today, right? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, you know, what is this? Okay, so now, so that's the first thing I'd like to share to you. You can have that kind of assurance when, when you know that God is going to providing for you everything. And then the second thing, the first one again, think about this. God is the one who gives you everything. Amen. Everything is from Him. 
The second thing is this, know who he is and know who you are. Two identities, two identities. Know who he is and know who you are. This is what John said, John 3, 28 to 29. You yourselves know, you yourselves know, know, okay, who he is. You yourselves know how plainly I told you, I am not the Messiah. He knew who he was. I'm only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries over, uh, the bride, and the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. So John knew that he was not the Messiah. Jesus was the Messiah. He was baptizing people, but he understood that the Messiah has a role he cannot do, and he recognized that. And again, he was happy about it. And for me, it is very important. If you notice, like during the baptism, by the way, I'm going to read to you a verse that tells us more about the attitude of John that many of us don't catch. Even people that have been going to church for quite a while. Mark 1, 7, it says, John announced, Someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I am not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. A lot of times when we read that, what's the understanding? John is saying, Jesus is so great, I'm so low, that the only thing I'm worthy of doing for him is to untie the straps of his sandals. Right? That's a common understanding about it. But it's not the way John said. It's not what John said. John said, he's so high, I'm so low, that even untying the straps of his sandals, I am not worthy. So he realized how great God was and how low he was, but... And I'm going to go to that later. Do you mean, Pastor, we got to lose our self-esteem? No, 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 not so. There's a reason why he was saying this, and it's good for you and me. It's good for you and me. Because it is there where we find our value. A lot of times we forget that we are already important. Remember again, you're not just more than okay. You're great. Can you say that again, please? Tell the person again. Just tell the other person next to you, okay? You're not just okay. You're more than okay. Say that. You're more than okay. You're great. Now listen carefully, because many of us get tempted by the enemy here. How many of you know the story of Adam and Eve and the fall in the garden, right? Many of us, many of us, right? You remember the lure or the allurement that Satan pers- uh, prene- or, uh, de- declared before or, or tempted Adam or Eve with, not Adam. It was the lady who was tempted. I want that emphasized. I'm just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. No haters, no haters here. I love both male and female, all right? I mean, I mean, in, in the sense that's godly. Okay? So Eve comes along and goes. I mean, not Eve. Satan. Satan comes, the serpent comes along and says, if you eat this fruit, remember what he said, you will be like God. Remember that? How many of you remember that? Say amen. Okay? amen. If you eat this fruit, you will be like God. He didn't say, Satan didn't say you will be God. He said you will be like God. And this is something that I want to point out to you because this is very important. What is that? Satan was offering to Eve something she was already. Because when God created Adam and Eve, He said, I will make you unto my likeness. Adam and Eve were already like God. But the reason why she was deceived is because she forgot her value. That's why you got to keep on reminding each other, you're not just okay, you're more than okay, you're actually great. And the reason why you're great is because you are created in the likeness of God. So when you say, you got to know who He is, and you got to know who you are, because it is in this area where you start saying, I may be created in God's image, but I'm still compared to Him, so far away from Him. But it doesn't stop me from worshiping Him. And the reason why it's very important that we worship and elevate God is because we are connected to Him. What are you saying, Pastor? You're confusing me. I'm not here to confuse you. Okay? Listen carefully. Your worth and mine are often associated with the object or the entity we worship. Your value or your perceived value is often connected to wherever, whoever, whatever it is that you give. When you say worship, by the way, the word is worth. Worship. So worship is, I may be saying I'm a Christian who worship God, but if I elevate money more than God, that's my God. 
That's the one I place the most worth to, and that's the one I worship. Are you here with me? Yes. A lot of people in the world don't believe in God. A lot of people believe in God, but it doesn't matter sometimes, whatever their convictions are, a lot of times they have something else they set as a priority or the idol that they place their worth on that money, fame, relationships. But what happens is the moment they grab hold of that pursuit they had for a very long time, they dreamt about it, they pursued it, they tried their best, and they got it. They experience the exhilarating joy and satisfaction that their pursuit gave them. They pursued it for years and years and years. Finally, they got it. And then suddenly, a sense of dissatisfaction comes to them. I've got my first million, I got my second million, I got my third million, and why is it not satisfying me? Why is it still lacking? You would wonder why there are millionaires who end their lives and take their lives in their own hands is because what they thought was worth the most didn't give them anything, it was empty. Solomon, King Solomon was a typification of this and personification of this when he said, boy, I got everything. Name it, I got it. He was the richest king who ever lived. I don't know, I think right now he's still probably the richest. Okay, he's got choirs. He, 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 he had choirs in his room. He had supplies of food. He had like so much wealth. People were giving a lot of things to him. He was the king. He was the wisest person who lived during that time or perhaps ever. And by the way, for those of you who don't know, he had 700 wives. OMG, some people would say that. I didn't say that. I'm just trying to copy some of you. <laughs> 700 wives, and as if it was not enough, he added 300 concubines. 1,000. How do you deal with that? I only have one. And it's not easy. <laughs> I'm happy, but it's not easy. <laughs> a thousand. Come on. But he had that. But you know what he said? Everything is meaningless. Amen. Vanity, a chasing after nothing, a chasing after the wind. And it's a reality. When you forget that God is there as the highest worth, you forget your value. But when you worship God and you realize that the higher you place Him in your life and you realize that your connection with Him is this, that I worship God and I'm created in His image, the more you worship God, the more you elevate yourself as well. Are you here with me? Yes. Because in God, let me assure you, if you haven't yet done it, in God you will find absolute and complete satisfaction and fulfillment. Amen. I guarantee you. I used to dare people, I used to dare people like, give your life to Jesus. And if you think that's a mistake, you can kill me. I used to say that. I used to say that. I want to say it again now, but I won't, okay? Because there's a lot of um, cuckoos out there. <laughs> Let me take it seriously. But listen, Kevin, some, and some people try to say, you are already created in God's image, but a lot of people are pursuing a different image. Like, a lot of people are pursuing it. I want that career. I want to be an engineer like him. I want to be a lawyer like him. I want to be a doctor like him. I want to be a singer like, him, like her. I want to be this and this and that. I want to be the football, football player like him. I want to be a, a base, you know, a league player. I want to be an NBA it's a, it's, it's a sieve. Being like another person is going to satisfy them. I want to look like Brad Pitt. I want to look like Chris Evans. I want to look like, who's this Thor guy? Who's this Thor? What's his name? That's not Chris Hemsworth. Chris Hemsworth? Is it Chris? Yes. Yeah. What's with this Chris is? I mean, they're good looking. Chris Evans, oh, for those of you who are older than me, we got Ben Affleck, Robert Redford, and... <laughs> it's okay. And some of you ladies, you want to look like Jennifer... Aniston, Jennifer Connelly. Who else? Jennifer's, Jennifer's, right? Yes. What with this Chris's and Jennifer's? But you want to be in that image when in reality you don't have to be because you've already been created in the greatest image that could ever be. Yes. And some people feel so easy, unless I become like that, I don't feel important. You know what? Some people even said, some of you are feeling so not important that you need a dog. You feel special. Speaking about dog, though, before we close, okay, I know I'm taking time here. 
But speaking about dogs, I wanted to show you something. That's Snow. My dog. Another picture of Snow. Another one? That's, that's her. The next one? Oh, that's not my dog. That's my, that's my time. <laughs> Merry Christmas. You know, it's like when I come home, even when I come home at about 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, she sleeps with her out there, the eldest. Right? When I come home, even if that door is, is almost closed and that light is off, I come home and she would come out and greet me like none of my family members would greet me. <laughs> Super excited, jumping up and down. Like, even if I don't have a treat, she would be like up and down. She would want me to pat her. I don't want to do it right away because she peeks when you do. <laughs> but I, so I was like so so excited, and in, in your stuff you're going, oh, I'm so important. <laughs> but here's a big but, okay? Dirty mind, some of you. Okay, so <laughs> within five seconds of that excitement, after you just greeted me, she goes back into her office room and leaves me alone. So what's my point? If you find significance from a dog, have mercy on you. Don't find significance on a DOG. Yeah, you know where I'm going here, all right? Don't find significance on a DOG. Find significance on a capital G O T. Elevate him for who he is. And this is something I'd like to offer you. Our desire, really honestly, not everybody in this world would want to have something to do with God. But the Lord has brought you here. I believe it on my heart for a reason and a purpose. For those of you who are already part of another church and you're enjoying your relationship with God there, I really want to thank you for your visit. I appreciate that. Celebrating this with us. Go back there next Sunday. Serve God there. But for those of you who are not yet sure about the position and place of Christ Jesus in your life. That's the reason why he brought you here. When you say elevating him, who is Jesus? He was saying he is the Messiah. You know what that means? Jesus said, I'm the anointed one. The word Messiah or Christ. By the way, Christ is not the last name of Jesus. <laughs> some of you, some of you, some, really, some of us have that understanding. Jesus, each Christ. I don't know where they find that. I don't know where they got that age from. <laughs> No, they were like, they stood there talking, oh, Jesus H. Christ. The word Christ is from the Greek word Christos, which was taken from the Hebrew word, by the way, Mashiach, which means Messiah, which only means the anointed one. When Jesus Christ came, he said, that God has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. And he's for you. More important than your own word and significance. More important than you feeling confident here on earth that nobody can step all over you. Not to be proud, but to say it doesn't matter what he says, it doesn't matter what she's done to me, it doesn't matter what abuse I receive. It doesn't matter how they, how they make me feel insignificant and how unaccepted and how rejected I feel even in my own family. It doesn't matter what people do. I am worth something. So that's beautiful. But more important than that is something that is of eternal value. When he says, I preach the gospel to the poor, that's good news for those who are not just poor physically, but poor when it comes to their spiritual status before God. If I ask you right now, if Jesus Christ comes today, do you know exactly where you're going? Like if I ask you to rate it 1 to 100%, that you know that you know that you know that you're going to be with Jesus in eternity and your score is somewhere between like 0 to 1 you need Jesus that's obvious if your score is from 0 to 50 you need Jesus today if your score is from 0 to 99 you need Jesus today because God said in his word I've written these things for you to know now that's a now statement I've written these words for you to know that you have eternal life. Amen. Nothing more peaceful than that. Nothing more restful than that. 
When you've got Christ inside of you, people can tell you, rest in peace, and you're going to go, hallelujah, praise God. <laughs> because you know exactly that's true. Amen. You know exactly that's true. Find it in Christ. He said, I have been anointed to preach the good news to the poor. Today is a day for you. If you don't know yet, if you're going to go with the Lord in eternity, we're raising a mob before you. Who is Jesus? He is the anointed Savior. He is the anointed Savior. Can I tell you an honest truth? This church, though we invited you here, this church, though we love it, this church, the Sheila, thank you so much for those beautiful words. Go to Yelp, all of you. Go five star. <laughs> this church, it doesn't matter how wonderful it is, at least in our estimation, it's not ever going to save you. That's right. Not our religion. Not our church. Not our denomination. Not anybody here. Because there's one person who's elevated and exalted to be the Savior, and that is Jesus Christ. Yeah. And that's so you come back. And I know people, a lot of people, a lot of people, a lot of people I meet would rather prefer religion or a church or a person or a priest or a pastor or a, or, or a profession or anything else. They put that as number one as an idol. They would rather prefer anybody. If you, by the way, and I believe that anybody, not anybody may be saved, but here's the deal. If your heart really wants to seek the truth, and if you really want to serve God, if you want to start a journey like that, I'm going to tell you it's the most amazing journey anybody could ever have. Amen. And I'm not to, talking about Christianity that is mediocre. I'm not talking about Christianity that is haphazard. I'm not talking about Christianity that is like 20% in. I'm talking about all out, all in, all the way for Jesus Christ. That's what we want here. And if you want that kind of relationship with God, we invite you to join us. If you don't have a church yet, you're welcome to be a part of the team. And you start out with us. I'm going to pray a simple prayer. If you want to start this journey, where you know that you know, but pastor, I know I've sinned against God. It's okay. Jesus already paid for it. I mean, sin is not okay, but it's okay. He already paid for it. But I've heard from somebody that because of my sins, I'm separated from God. Yes, it's true. But Jesus has already reconciled you. He has already made a bridge between you and God. All you have to do now is say, Jesus, yes, I elevate you in my life. As who you are, the Savior. And I surrender my life to you as Lord. If that's a desire of your heart, to start your journey today and be ever stronger every day. Be ever stronger every day in Him. Pray this prayer to, together with me from your heart. Don't think about anybody else beside you. If you're serious about it, I know you don't care about anybody else right now but Him. For those of you who have already committed to Jesus before, and you want to support those doing this for the first time, say it also, support them. From the bottom of your heart, say this all together loudly, confidently, boldly. Declare this before God. Everybody, dear God in heaven, I sincerely come before you with my heart open. Yes, I know I have sinned against you. And I've heard that because of my sins, I am separated from you. But thank you, Jesus. Because of you, I can be forgiven. I can be reconciled to God. I can be made new. So I open my heart right now. And I invite Jesus. Please come into my life. Come into my heart. Be my only Savior and my Lord. I surrender all I am. I surrender all I have to you. Please help me to follow you. Wash me. Cleanse me. Give me a new beginning. Make me a new creation in Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Everybody say amen. amen. You know what comes after that? Huge, big round of applause. For the possibility. If you are true, if you're a true believer in Jesus, you'll be excited about it. 
right? Amen. And if you've done it for the first time today, welcome to the family of God. Amen. 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 Amen.